Hello, good, we'll get started. Apologize for the difficulties that we've had here. Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. I am David Ross. It is an honor to serve as the Duluth Area Chamber's Executive Director. It is exciting to connect with you, even though it is done electronically. It is a time of uncertainty and challenge within our beloved community. Today, we gather with you to provide timely information regarding the resources we have available to us as we seek relief and support during the coronavirus pandemic. We are partnering with three exceptional organizations which are collaborating to bring you this webinar. The first is Congressman Pete Stauber's 8th Congress Congressional District, and we will soon uh, hear from our Congressman. I want to thank Isaac Schultz, the District Director for Pete's office. He has been a, just a, a, a delight to work with as we have prepared for this. And so now we will transition. First, we're going to hear from uh, Congressman Stauber, and then we're going to hear from our partner, the U.S. Chamber. We'll hear from John Kirshner, the Chamber's Executive Director of Congressional and Public Affairs, and then we will hear from our third partner, the U.S. Small Business Administration, and we will greatly benefit by hearing from the Acting Director at the U.S. Small Business Administration, Brian McDonald. Brian uh, has earned his master's degree in business administration from Georgetown University and his bachelor's degree from Syracuse University. He is based out of Minneapolis office. He knows our community well. And at this point, I'll turn it over to a uh, hometown kid, the pride of uh, Denfield High School, our own hometown hero, um, Pete Stauber. So Pete, please get us started. Well, thank you very much, David. It's uh, much appreciated. It's great to be with you all today. And um, if uh, the statement that small business is the engine of our economy, if you don't believe that after seeing what we're going through now, you don't have a heartbeat. And uh, I'm on the small business uh, committee and really working with the small business administration during this uh, pandemic. You know, we're all in this situation through no fault of our own. And uh, so the goal is to, is to get through this. And, and I, I firmly believe that as a nation, we're gonna get through this stronger. We will, we will be more uh, stronger, more resilient, more self-reliant than we've ever been before. And so let's talk about kind of where the federal government uh, was at and where we are at today. So the, the first package uh, uh, was the 8.3 billion that was to help uh, develop a vaccine and get uh, and start producing uh, and investing in our medical equipment and such that we knew we were going to need. And then package two was the, the, the family relief. What that did is allow that uh, testing to be uh, paid for free of charge. If you were symptomatic, you wouldn't have to pay it. And it also gave that two week uh, of paid family medical leave for those uh, COVID-19 related events in, for you or a member of your household. And then, of course, we have the CARES Act, which uh, we enacted uh, a couple weeks ago. And um, that really was for the small businesses to help our local and state governments, help our hospitals, and, uh, and of course, again, our small businesses with the PPP program. And I think uh, we know that the CARES package wasn't perfect, but it was really a good attempt in a bipartisan fashion uh, to make sure that we could invest in our small businesses and to the best of our ability, uh, get them back to where they were prior to this pandemic. And where they were prior to the pandemic, we, we had uh, a nation that was uh, surging a small uh, business. The optimism was extremely high. Uh, we had unemployment, the historic, uh, historically low unemployment, uh, unemployment. And we had entrepreneurs across this nation um, you know, getting into business and, and living the American dream. But we are today, uh, we're here today through no fault of our own, but we're going to get through this together. And so every week uh, we have a call with Secretary Mnuchin and we had our call this morning. So uh, I want to run over some, run through some numbers that he gave me and I'm just going to read these off my notes. So um, the, uh, the, uh, the, there's been 1 million PPP loans already in the eight days through the Small Business Administration. $240 billion has been processed with 4,600 lenders on board. 
um, and $2 billion in PPP money uh, and loans is leaving every single hour. Um, and that's why uh, Secretary Mnuchin said, maybe by the end of this week, we may be out of that PPP money. That is why Senator McConnell wanted that clean 250, the extra 250 billion to go directly to the CARES Act directly in the PPP with no strings attached. That could have easily be de been done by unanimous consent. And uh, that may still happen, and I hope it does. Um, so what, what's happening right now is uh, uh, the, the, the loans we have for our small business, we have the, the idle loans, uh, the economic injury loans uh, through SBA. We have the PPP through, going through the SBA, and as you all know, it's going through the 7A, that, that avenue, that on-ramp that that's, uh, the SBA already has. And then, of course, uh, we talked about the PPP it's very, and the unemployment insurance. And so I think that the goal is to, is to try and get our small businesses back to where they were prior to this pandemic. And we know that the CARES Act wasn't perfect. We're seeing some things we can change or add to it uh, in this next package. Uh, and the hope is that as we uh, legislate uh, in D.C., uh, and through our conference that we really focus uh, on cares. We focus on the health and safety of the American people and not uh, put any partisan pieces of legislation in there um, that don't have uh, any direct relation to making sure our small business men and women can get back up on their feet and, and move forward. But um, we're, we're, I think we're, we're putting um, our best effort forward and, and look at the speed that the federal government is going right now historic speed the ppps those loans have been available for eight days now and they're just they're just wrapping those loans up and really the concern for us in the small business committee david was the concern that the that small business administration would be flooded and that's exactly what's happening so they're trying to add staff get more it and make sure that the small business owners can get that money and get it in a timely fashion so they can meet their uh, uh, current and uh, short-term obligations. So that's kind of the wrap up where we are now. It looks like we won't be back into DC till at the earliest May 4th. It could be beyond that, uh, but the modeling that they're doing at our nation's capital, um, it's still in question right now, but uh, we're doing a lot using our technology that we have here. Uh, and before I, uh, we go to questions or the other folks here, I wanna talk about I really think that we're gonna have a healthy, bipartisan, nonpartisan debate on the supply chain in this nation. And I'll give you an example. Uh, this came directly from FEMA for our PPEs, our, those rubber gloves that the police officers and our doctors and nurses and, and what have you, what we use right now, uh, almost 100% come from the country of Malaysia. And so we have to look at the supply chain and make sure that on those strategic health and safety and those needs that the American people have, where do we want this manufacturing to be? And I think you're going to see that uh, pushed in our country. And that, that bodes well for our 8th District of Minnesota. You're going to see that strategic metal and those minerals that are strategic national security safety interests uh, be part of that conversation as well. So with that, I'm happy to be here. I've got some staff members on the line, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, your other guests too. Thank you so much, Congressman. I appreciate very much your update and your uh, optimism for how we might re-enter and restart our Duluth area once this passes. And I very much appreciate having an advocate like you within the Congress. We'll move now to John Kushner, and he is with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and uh, serves a seven-state area, Minnesota being one of them and is, he has been an outstanding resource to the Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce and to the Minnesota Chamber as well. And John has a very strong feel for this. He has some terrific background in the area, and he is now going to share with us an update from the U.S. Chamber. Thank you, David. Um, I'm gonna share, do my best to share my screen here, and I'm gonna walk through a quick hopefully a quick PowerPoint that will give us kind of an overview of the Federal CARES Act, a lot of what the good Congressman talked about. Um, and then I know Brian from the SBA is on board and he'll probably be able to answer a lot of the questions I can to get very specific to SBA. Um, 
Just talk real quickly here, major provisions in the bill for individuals. It's a $2 trillion package. So that's about 10% of our country's GDP. So it's very significant, obviously. Um, there's also potential for another $4 trillion in support of the economy through the Federal Reserve in terms of how they can leverage some of that lending. On the individual side, we're starting to see this roll out right now, $1,200 per individual um, in automatic payments to taxpayers, $2,400 for a joint return with an additional $500 per child. That's phased out for incomes above $75,000 and $150,000 joint. Another big com significant component of this for as it relates to individuals is expanded unemployment. Uh, most restrictions on the eligibility for unemployment have been suspended if that unemployment is directly related to COVID-19. The federal government is kicking in an additional $600 per week on top of your regular state benefit and that'll run through July 31st. Um, the eligibility does end when an individual can return to work and I know this was an often discussed and debated um, item in Congress when this bill was being debated because there was some concern that if I could make, I might potentially be making more money on unemployment than I am if I'm working. Um, but Congress is very, due dil very diligent on noting that that eligibility is going to end when an individual can return to work. These benefits also are provided through your state unemployment offices right now. Minnesota's already raised their hand and said, yes, we'll accept that money. And so, um, the Minnesota's Depart um, state Economic unemployment office, excuse me, unemployment insurance office is distributing this money already. Um, on the employer side, we'll talk a little bit about what's available to all employers, larger employers and small businesses. Um, all employers, um, big component here, payroll taxes. You can delay payment of your employer payroll taxes. That's 6.2% of social security that you pay in payroll taxes between now and January 1 of 2021. If you choose to do that, 50% is gonna be due at the end of 2021 and 50% will be due at the end of 2022. It's important to note, this is not a payroll tax cut. This is purely a delay in payment um, to allow you as a business owner a little bit more liquidity in terms of keeping your lights on and keeping your employees employed. It's important to note that this does not apply to employers who've had loans forgiven under the Paycheck Protection Program. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Quickly, tax changes. There's some changes on net operating loss, AMT credits, interest deductibility, quality improvement, property fix. And I'm moving through this quickly. We can answer some questions if you'd like, but I want to make sure we have time for Q&A and for Brian to help us out as well here. Another item that hasn't been talked about a lot, but is an important tool if, if, if businesses are interested is the employee retention credit. And this is available to employers who are fully or partially shut down or have 50% drop in gross receipts in a quarter compared to the prior year. And what it is, is it's a refundable tax credit for 50% of the wages, including health plan expenses paid by the employer up to $10,000 per employee. So you think about it, this is basically a $5,000 per employee tax credit. Employers with more than hundred employees, it will apply to only to your employees that are not providing services. So if you're paying them, but they're at home, not able to work or not able to come in, if you've been shut down, be deemed unessential. Um, if you have less than hundred employees, it will apply to all employees paid during the eligible time period. Similar to the payroll tax delayed payment, employers are not eligible if they receive a payment paycheck protection program loan. That's a lot of P's, excuse me. Uh, quickly, mid-sized, larger employers. There's a total of 500 billion available for mid-sized and larger employers. 454 billion um, went to the Treasury for loans, loan guarantees, um, and support of federal credit reserve facilities. The remaining 46 billion was for special programs for the airline industry and critical national security businesses. I will say, if you choose to avail yourself to these programs, they're likely to see some restrictions on stock buybacks and executive compensation for a year, or potentially even longer. Um, real quickly here into the Paytech, Paycheck Protection Program, which is the new program that really the Congressman spent the bulk of his time talking about. This is a program that is $349 billion in loans for small businesses, um, 501c3 nonprofits, self-employed, sole proprietors, and independent contractors. So it's a very far-reaching, very inclusive program. The loans are equal to the lesser amount of two and a half months of your average payroll or $10 million. An important distinction here, and um, there's, we all talk a little bit later about how to figure this out, but you can only include up to $100,000 of an employee's 
salary in this calculation. So if you have an employee who makes $150,000, you can include that, but only up to $100,000. So that's important to note. What's also unique about this program is, is that it's being implemented through loans by local and national lenders. So it's an SBA program, but it's being run through lenders right there in Duluth, local lenders, national lenders, and all around the state and all around the country. Very minimal requirements to qualify for these loans. And what's particularly unique about this program is that these loans will convert to grants equal to the amount spent on payroll, rent, interest on your mortgage, and utilities for eight weeks after the origination of the loan. So long as 75% of that is payroll. So if you get a $10 million loan and you spend $8 million on all of those items, if 75% of that's payroll and then the rest is on rent, interest on your mortgage, utilities, that $8 million turns into a grant and is forgiven and you don't have to repay that. It's important to note, however, that loan forgiveness is reduced proportionally if the employer reduces full-time employees. And similarly, the loan forgiveness is reduced if the employer reduces wages by more than 25%. However, um, if the employer can avoid that reduction if they bring back employees and restore wages generally within 30 days and maintain that through June 30th. So, and this dates back to February 15th. So if you have already had to lay off employees or in the very short term have to lay off employees related to COVID-19, if you can bring them back within eight weeks of origination and maintain that through June 30th, you don't have to worry about um, the reduction in forgiveness on your paycheck protection program. Um, great resource here. If you haven't seen it, I'd encourage you to go to uschamber.com slash sbloans. We have a great four page easy checklist how do I qualify? What are lenders looking for? Um, you know, how do, how do I figure out that two and a half months payroll? What's included? What's excluded? You know, if I'm a sole proprietor, an independent contractor, maybe a seasonal business, there's different rules for um, different classifications there. It's, it's a great resource. So I'd encourage you to check that out. Move quickly here into the idle loans. Idle loans are particularly particularly new. They're typically used for natural disasters, you know, um, things of that nature. Uh, but these, these are available to small businesses and nonprofits, including faith-based nonprofits with few hundred, fewer than 500 employees, again, sole proprietors, independent contractors. Um, I, I need to update this, and Brian will probably talk about this a little bit later. Um, these programs, my understanding, and, and I think Brian will clarify again, are it sounds like the loans are being capped around $25,000, $35,000. I think the demand for this program has been so high that, um, that they're just running out of money similar to the PPP loans. And, and you know, we're pushing Congress and others are as well in terms of um, you know, refilling the coffers for the PPP, but also the, these idle loans as well. Um, these, again, payments can be deferred up to one year, again, to provide liquidity um, for your business. Loans are gonna be based on your credit scores, no, you know, up to $200,000 without a personal guarantee. Um, there's an up to $10,000 emergency grant. And uh, typically these are paid within three days. But again, due to the high demand, it's taking a little bit longer to get these emergency grants out, but they are still out there. This does interact with the Paycheck Protection Program. You can avail yourself to both loan programs, but you can't double dip, so to speak. So you can't spend your money on the same purposes. So before you go to your lender and get a PPP loan and go to the SBA and get your EIDL loan. You need to really have a good conversation with your lender and accountant or whomever is advising you on these matters to determine where you're going to spend your money and how you're going to spend that to make sure that you don't disqualify yourself one way or another. This program, you do apply directly through the SBA at sba.gov. You can go there and find your banks in your community. And I suspect David and the team at the Duluth Chamber also knows which lenders. Yes. Um, and, I, I always joke that, you know, make sure they're a qualified lender and make sure they're qualified by being a good member, good member in standing of your local chamber as well. I would encourage that. Um, and just to summarize this real quickly, you know, this, this phase three is, was a lot about providing liquidity for businesses. It was about keeping your lights on, keeping your doors open as much as you can legally now, um, keeping your employees employed and engaged with your business. This was largely meant to be a bridge to get our economy 
through this COVID-19 so then when we are able to open that your employees are engaged with you and so that when you say yay we're open yes we're open for business again they can come back right away and you don't have to kind of ramp your business up again but it's also about not swamping and bankrupting our state unemployment insurance offices as well and I'm I suspect that's going to be part of a phase four maybe the congressman will talk about that later but this is very much how do we when we can start turning that dial and turning our economy back on how do we make it easy for employers and employees to to be engaged in that process to turn on as quickly as they can and so that's really a lot of what this pro these programs are about i'll touch very briefly on phase two phase as the congressman said phase one was very much about a vaccine phase two was very much about people and employees in terms of early on in the process if they'd have to be away from work now, frankly, all of us are away from work for a variety of reasons, uh, but phase two, um, paid sick leave, um, employers with less than 500 employees required to provide up to 10 days of paid sick leave if that leaves related to COVID-19. This is about taking care of yourself if you're ill or quarantined, taking care of a quarantined family member, or for basically all of us now, again, a child during school, with a due to a school or childcare closure. This leaves paid at the regular rate up to $511 per day, Two thirds of that um, with a maximum of $200 per day if you're caring for a family member. Um, this is reimbursed by the federal government. This leave is in addition to any other leave an employer provides, not in place of, but in addition to. Small exemption for businesses with less than 50 employees. You may be exempt from providing this leave related to caring for a child whose school or daycare is closed if providing that leave threatens the viability of your business. And this paid sick leave is not available to an employee who can telework. Similarly, FMLA, very similar rules to paid leave, up to 10 weeks uh, paid leave, $200 per day, um, $10,000 in aggregate uh, reimbursed by the federal government. Again, this is in addition to any leave you're already providing as an employer. Same exemption applies for employers with less than 50 employees and not available if an employee can telework. Quick resources here, uschamber.com. We've got great fat sheets, checklists on the idle loans, on the PPP loans, on the employee retention credit. All of this is there. Tremendous resources updated daily for small businesses in particular, uschamber.com slash co. It has all these fact sheets, but also a lot of good resources for just tips and tools for how to stay engaged with your employees and how to you know work remotely and, and a lot of things like that. And I forgive me if I was running through it quickly, but I want to make sure we have time for Brian to answer any questions, go through what he wants to talk about, and then you know we can hand it back to David to go through the Q and A of um, what everyone, what everybody's really interested in. So with that, I'll hand it back to David and Brian. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so very much, John. Greatly appreciated. Outstanding detail. A lot of information for us. We're so fortunate now to transition directly to Brian McDonald, the acting director of the U.S. Small Business Administration based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. So pleased to have you with us, Brian. Thank you and look forward to your detail. And once you're done, then we'll have all three of you available for questions. So please proceed, Brian. Thank you so much, David and Congressman Sauber and the team at the Duluth Chamber for, for all of your leadership. And uh, thank you to John. I'm enjoying doing these presentations with, with you, John, and you're doing such a great job. And it makes it so easy for me to, to follow you after, after that. So um, SBA, we're doing everything that we can and working hard with our partners now to provide critical financial and technical assistance across all of our communities here in Minnesota. And that includes um, communities that represent 500,000 small businesses just here in, in Minnesota alone. And we have about 400 SBA lenders, and, and that number is growing. So we appreciate the opportunity today to share information on our programs. And the CARES Act is the largest economic recovery package ever put together in our, in our country. And SBA got the new PPP program with Treasury standing up in just five days. So as Pete mentioned, there have definitely been some bumps on the road and late nights um, from, from our team here, but significant amounts of capital are already on the street for many Minnesota small businesses and, and also across the country. And more things continue to get streamlined. Um, at the end of the day, this program will provide much needed relief to millions of small businesses so they can 
sustain their businesses and keep workers employed. And these loans will be forgiven, as John was saying, as long as the funds are used to keep employees on the payroll and for certain other expenses. So for both small businesses and lenders, if you need a document, you can find it at www.sba.gov slash PPP, and that's where it is or that's where it will be. Um, so for guidance documents, uh, forms, FAQs, that's the place to go. So here so far in Minnesota, our office is doing two trainings a day, um, and we just started rolling out two trainings a week in Spanish. And we're working on adding some new staff to the team here at the Minnesota District Office. And really our primary focus is on answering questions that you have um, from small business owners and um, working, with, working with our chamber partners. So thank you for having us here today. And also questions from, from lenders as well. So in the past couple of days, we have added a few new Minnesota PPP delegated authority lenders, and they've already been approving and doing loans here in Minnesota. And they're utilizing a new gateway portal called SBA Connect, and that's on sba.gov slash PPP to submit these to submit these loans. And we partnered, um, SBA did, with the private sector to get this done. And I think, you know, we credit some of the partnerships and some of the folks who have stepped forward at the national level to, to help us um, get, this, get this program rolling, like the congressman said. So if you're looking for a PPP lender here in Minnesota, if, you, um, if, if your current bank um, isn't providing that service, or if you just want to see a list of who is providing PPP loans, you can go to our district office website at sba.gov slash MN. And new FAQs are coming out nearly every day at this point. Last weekend, there was, um, there was guidance, and we've seen some guidance on faith-based um, organizations, uh, more on nonprofits. And since we've actually been on this call here this afternoon. I just saw there's FAQs that came out on self-employment, gambling institutions, and um, more information with regards to the SBA program. So there's even been some updates since we've on, been on the call here. And I know we want to get over to some questions and back to the congressman, um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the great technical assistance providers that we have in Minnesota as well. Um, notably in Duluth, we have the Entrepreneur Fund, and they have um, specifically the Women Business Alliance, which is a, which is a great resource, and um, also the great work of the Northland Foundation, SBDC in Duluth as well. And we also have um, a great chapter resource of SCORE mentors. So technical assistance can be just as critical right now as, as financial assistance in, in many ways. So I just wanted to make sure that um, you are aware of those resources as well. And there's a search tool on our website if, if you need that information. Um, so with that, um, the best way to stay updated on some of the SBA program updates are to sign up at sba.gov slash updates. And we have a great um, social media Twitter handle as well. That's at SBA underscore Minnesota. And we post several times on social media as well. And should you have any specific questions, if you're not getting um, the right kind of service on PPP or EIDL, we do have a direct email box here at the Minnesota District Office, and, and we're local here, so we'll do everything we can to, to help you out. And that's minneapolis.mn at sba.gov. And so with that, I know we have, we have questions we want to get to. Get to so um, back to you, David. Thank, thank you so much for, for letting, letting me on the call today. Thank you, Brian. The SB Thank you, Brian. The SBA has been outstanding in making information available to our members. We've been including your post and your links on our daily updates to our members. And I'm just so impressed with the amount of information you've been making available to our region. So thank you, Brian, for you and what your colleagues are doing. We are now going to turn to questions and answers and uh, leading that effort will be Chris Johnson, our Director of Marketing and Communications for the Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce. We've had the opportunity to collect your questions prior to this webinar, but also through this chat opportunity and the questions that have obviously been coming in, 26 of them while we have been conducting this webinar. So I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Hello. 
I think the most pressing question, you know, now that we're kind of into this process, what we're seeing is a lot of the businesses have already applied for some of these loans um, and other grants. So the most common question I'm seeing is when will the funds be received? And I know, John, you kind of touched on um, there being so much demand that it might be taking a little longer than expected, but can any of you elaborate on when money might be distributed for the IDLE or the PPP or maybe some other grants that we're seeing? You know, I think that might be best for Brian because I know that's been a little bit of a moving target and I know there's been some frustration with that, but we've kind of been stressing when you're trying to pump $350 billion into the right. economy in the matter of two weeks, that's, there's going to Right. There's going to be some hiccups, but I think Brian, you might have a good understanding of how that timing is. The timelines changed a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so obviously, um, it's, it's it's the big question that that we're getting as well. And so, I think you kind of have to look at idle and PPP separately. Now, um, we do know um, that PPP is flowing here in Minnesota, and I've talked to many business owners myself. Um, who have already had loan loan funds um, in their bank accounts through PPP, so that that program that program is is running is running strong. And um, like I said, um, you know there there is a list of PPP lenders on our website. So if if you are kind of feeling like you're missing missing the action, you're you're more than welcome to to reach out to our office to try to find that or to, to ask us any questions and then we can kind of guide you to the, to the list of lenders. Plus I think um, the support structure at Entrepreneur Fund and Northland Foundation, um, both the WBC and, and SBDC could be, could be great places to go as well. So that's, that's the PPP side. Now I know the, the idle loan, um, I actually have heard as of this morning that some Minnesota businesses have received their idle advance payment. And so in terms of um, the advance now, um, I just wanna be clear on the message that, that I received from, from SBA headquarters. My, my understanding is that the idle advance is for up to 10,000. And it depends on the number of employees um, that are in your company for the idle advance. And, um, and I appreciate, I think John um, hit, the, hit the nail on the head with um, the reason that SBA decided to go that route is because the um the amount of demand for the programs and we were able to do the idle advance um through the cares act that was passed on on march 27. so we had the idle program loan program going um here in minnesota sometime in earlier mid mid-march and then we were able to add the enhancement of the idle advance um starting uh, march march 30th um because of because of the care act cares act so um, so I do appreciate everyone's um, patience with that. I do know that um, it's based on when you submit it. And um, I have heard from Minnesota small businesses as of this morning that they've received some of those idle advances. So they, they are flowing. Um, another question that we received is is there a way then to check on the status or the timeline of any of these applications um, for the businesses yes yeah, so um you know again it depends on if you're talking about ppp or the idle loan the ppp loans are directly through your sba lender so you could you could check on the status of your PPP loan by going through through the lender that you're working with um, on on the Paycheck Protection Plan. Now for the idle, this is a direct program from the SBA, and um, you know so I do know that some of the idle advances are coming out. Um, so I would say in in the next um, in, in over the next days. I would expect um, many of the people who are on the call that might have submitted those applications to start um, seeing those payments coming through. Now there is a 1-800 number to call to get if you want more specifics on your on your status. So David, I'll make sure to share that um, you know with with your team just kind of as follow up to this call. But it's 1-800-659-2955. And so you would actually be routed to the Office of Disaster Assistance at SBA. And some of the staff members there can look up your actual loan status. 
Thank you so much. We received a question from a tax exempt 501c3. They don't have employees, but they do have a stipend they have stipend volunteer leaders. Can you talk about what kind of options they might have for, you know, lost income due to the, the pandemic? Where can they receive funding? Congressman, do you want me to jump on this one? Yeah. Okay, so please. Right. So they so a 501c3 um, nonprofit is eligible for PPP. And perhaps, you know, depending on what type of entity it is, would also be eligible for an EIDL loan from SBA. Now, keep in mind that these two programs aren't designed to offset lost revenue. Um, the Paycheck Protection Plan, um, like the name implies, is to keep folks on your payroll. And that is basically, you know, W-2 employees. And, that, and that's how the program is designed. So I see that as being kind of a challenge, you know, based on the information that, that you just gave me there. If, um, if folks are unpaid or um, not receiving, receiving any pay, the way that PPP works is, is we look at, um, and John kind of went into the details a little bit, is um, that we look at the average monthly payroll um, over the last 12 months. And then we take your average month, monthly payroll, apply by two and a half. And so that really is what covers um, the eight weeks window on the, on the PPP program. Now the EIDL loan is um, pretty similar in some ways, although um, you can apply for both. Um, and so with the EIDL program, that would enable you to get money so that you can pay your fixed debts and pay your bills that you might not otherwise be able to pay. So both of these programs um, that SBA ha has are not designed to offset that, that lost revenue. So I don't know, John or Congressman, if, if you have anything else to jump in on, on that. Yeah, Brian, the only thing I would add as it relates to the nonprofit with stipend um, employees, you know, it's not a typical salary or a typical wage, you know, I would presume that the stipend could be included as we talk about it. We say, you know, salary, wage, commission, or similar compensation. So I would presume when you figure out your payroll, you could figure out your average stipend. Um, I would also say that, you know, double check with your with your lender or accountant or whomever before making that assumption. But I would um, believe that a stipend would be included in what would consider a payroll cost, so to speak. And, and John and, and uh, Brian, if I could just go on, I, I would think, uh, I believe you're accurate uh, in that. And also, um, if that uh, nonprofit has uh, utilities uh, that they're paying, that's where the PPP uh, can help as well. Thank you so much. Um, let me see. So a couple questions about some of the rules of the PPP. So do you have to bring back all of your employees? Um, and if, if not, are you gonna have to pay back that money? Or you know, even if it's used for those operational costs? And secondly, can you hire fewer employees back, but then pay them more? So essentially you're paying the same type of payroll in amount, but you're paying fewer people more. Can you, you touch on either of those? Sure. So, um, so basically, for the fully forgiven part for the Paycheck Protection Plan loans, so these funds are provided in the form of loans from an SBA lender, and they would be fully forgiven if used for payroll costs, interest on mortgages, rent and utilities, as long as 75% of that is used for payroll. Now, forgiveness, the intent of the program is that forgiveness is based on the employer maintaining or quickly rehiring employees and maintaining the salary levels. So then forgiveness, um, my understanding is forgiveness would be reduced if full-time headcount declines or if salaries and wages decline. Yeah, and I would add to that, Brian, and I, I think that's exactly right. The only thing I would add to that is saying, specifically relating to can I hire fewer employees back but pay them more? it's not kind of either or, right? If you reduce your headcount, you need to bring that headcount back up. It's not about 
the actual payroll number. The, again, the kind of the underlying goal is keeping these employees on the payroll, not keeping your payroll kind of artificially high. So it's about the headcount of the actual employees, not the dollar amount specifically. No, John, John, this is Pete, you're absolutely right. And what you want to do, the PPP was specifically de designed to ensure uh, that uh, the, the employees were kept on the payroll um, and, and kept on the insurance and then were, were connected to that business. So when they do uh, open up and the economy starts to uh, come back, that they're still connected to that business and that uh, business owner doesn't lose that employee. Thank you. Can you speak on if, if a business has leftover money from these loans? Has, has that been talked about? Well, I would just add, I don't think that I, I believe there's not any um, penalty for, for prepayment on it. So if you have money you don't need, you don't have to spend that money, right? You can get whatever right. it is forgiven. And if you get 80% of it forgiven and you have 20% remaining, you can just take that money and pay it off right away. You don't have to, there's not a, penalty for maintaining that loan. Correct. And in full disclosure, some of the forgiveness guidance is still forthcoming. And so the earliest that um, a lender could put in for the forgiveness is seven weeks after the loan has been issued. So we're, um, so we, we haven't actually issued the guidance to, to clarify um, some, of, some of those points, but like John, John said, right, this is, this is a loan unless it could, it could be forgiven. Um, but if it's if it's not forgiven, then it would be a two-year loan at one percent interest. Thank you, um, Brian. This question is directed at you specifically from Shannon. It sounds like they're a lender, just started funding loans. Are we to tell SBA we funded it through the servicing function in ETRAN or the fifteen oh two? They've seen conflicting information. Sure. So yeah, that guidance. It just, it's not that I don't know, it's just that the guidance hasn't been issued um, directly on that. And um, believe me, we're getting that question from, you know, hundreds of lenders here in, in Minnesota alone. So that, that is definitely on our radar. And I know Colson um, does have some information kind of posted just generally on their website right now. So that, that's, a, that's a question from the lender side. Perfect. What about self-employed? Uh, professionals, why are some self-employed people being denied for unemployment? What are what are some resources for for self-employed? Um, you know what, uh, Chris, I can take this one. Then John and Brian, you can come in. First off, the self-employed are eligible uh, for this unemployment. And what's happening? I know uh, people have called our office and talked about uh, the, that they're not. They've had you know, talked about being self-employed. And because Minnesota D doesn't have the technology just yet to automatically enter, some of them are put on a hold. And I know, um, you know, some folks have called me and, and, and they've been in that quote holding pattern uh, for a couple of days now. And, uh, you know, I've asked uh, uh, the folks at Deed on our governor's call, on our delegation call, and they've said, just be patient. They're trying to, that, uh, that that's just a glitch. They're trying to get over uh, for this COVID crisis only. So can you imagine there's a lot of IT stuff, a lot of work to be done, and they are getting uh, a number of uh, those uh, uh, small business owners themselves that initially were put in the holding pattern and through dialogue saying, yep, now you're in the system and you're gonna proceed uh, as others do. But it is just a glitch in the system right now. And uh, just, uh, we ask for patience. And I know that uh, Minnesota Deed had talked to us in our uh, call this, uh, this morning on that. Just uh, patience uh, can be a virtue right now, but I know it's not easy. Perfect. Two questions about the PPP, I'm gonna roll into one. Um, are there still funds available? And how long is it taking to get approved? And are those criteria for the loan forgiveness, is that 100% finalized or can you, can they expect some requirements or announcements in the coming weeks? Right, so, um, so, so the Congressman did provide kind of an updated statistic. Um, I think he mentioned that there is um, over 240 billion as of this morning um, out of this 349 billion that was allocated on March 27th from from the CARES Act. So yes, there is 
still funding available, um, but I would recommend to um, obviously you want to work with your with your SBA lender, um, and the fund the funds you know have have been flowing. Now, um, in terms of the second part of the question on forgiveness, you know we've kind of outlined that these loans will be will be forgiven if used for payroll. Now, some of the exact mechanics of that guidance are still coming out. Um, if I if I may add to that, um, as of this morning, there was uh, uh, about a hundred billion dollars left in the PPP, and as Secretary Mnuchin said, uh, it's going out about two billion dollars an hour, and so uh, obviously it's less than that now. Um, so and that's why it was critical, or it's, it's critical uh, that that uh, extra two hundred and fifty billion that we want to put in the PPP cleanly via unanimous consent. That's why it's so important uh, because the PPP has been uh, extremely popular. It's a way to uh, get that uh, monies into the small businesses uh, uh, so they can uh, keep their employees, uh, pay their rent to utilities and uh, keep their employees on, uh, on, the, on their health insurance. And so that's why that 250 clean is really, really important to get that out before the end of the week, before that money runs out. Thank you. What about the eight week period? Um, this question is saying, does a business have to be back in business within eight weeks of receiving the funds? Are you, would, are they considering an extension of that? John, my understanding isn't that they have to be back in business per se. It's about returning those employees, re returning the headcount back to where it was or returning the wages back to where it was. And it's, it's about more paying the employees than it is um, returning for business because obviously a lot of businesses are currently shut down by mandate from the governor or, or a variety of reasons. And I, you know, and I think kind of that, and maybe the congressman can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that 349 billion was an estimate or a guesstimate. They had to put some pen to paper. And I think similarly that June 30th deadline was also an estimate in terms of when do we think we're going to be out of this and when do we think that the economy will start opening up again. And so um, and this is in terms of keeping those, as the congressman mentioned earlier, those employees engaged and connected to your business. It's not necessarily about returning to business specifically, but when the opportunity comes that you can, the goal is they're on payroll, they can come back into the office and get rolling right away. That's exactly right, John. Perfect. How can a business maintain their headcount if they're under a shutdown order? Well, I would just say that, you know, the way you maintain your headcount is through this PPP loan, right? That this PPP loan is designed to help you maintain that headcount. Now, I know there's a lot of external circumstances and it's a lot easier than saying, here's, here's two and a half months salary, keep people employed. I know it's more complicated than that, but that's really what the focus of this is maintaining that headcount. Even if you're not, your business is closed and you're not able to operate or you're operating at a, at a dramatically lower rate, the, the very purpose and point of this is to help you do that. I know it's a lot more complicated and not quite that simple, but that is, largely what the purpose of, of and the goal, and more importantly, the goal of this is. Thank you. Let's see. It says due to the $600 increase in unemployment benefits, many employees are earning more being unemployed than if the business hires them back. Can you comment on this? Is Uh, I, Chris, I, this is Pete. I didn't get the question. I'm sorry. It says due to the $600 increase in unemployment benefits, many employees are earning more on unemployment than if the business hires them back. Can you, can, can you elaborate yeah. on this? Yeah. So that obviously that wasn't the intention. We want uh, to dignify with uh, a person being able to work. Um, so that was, uh, that was the kind of the, the, the compromise, the middle ground that the Senate put forward. Um, I'm getting calls from uh, business owners that, that are telling me that $600, especially in the bar and restaurant business, that that $600, our waiters and waitresses were making more than that. That $600 does not meet what they were making. And so that was kind of that middle ground. And uh, 
you know, I think that uh, for, you know, as we, as we moved uh, towards opening up, the intention was never to uh, have somebody make more uh, than what they were when they were working, of course, but, you know, that's that compromise and keep in mind that when we open up and, and our, our state will open up for business, those employees, when you call them back, uh, they have to return to work. I mean, you, John Doe has to come back to work. Otherwise, they use, they lose the unemployment insurance, uh, et cetera, if they think they can make more. So when that, when that business is allowed to be opened and they call John Doe back, John Doe has to come back to work. Um, otherwise, they lose that portion uh, of the unemployment insurance because of the COVID crisis. Thank you. I'm going to read this one verbatim. The EIDL program has a $10,000 advance for completing the application. If an organization has already filed and been approved for PPP, can they also apply for the EIDL program, accept the $10,000 grant, and, but then not accept the EIDL loan? Um, it says right. yeah. the on the PPP loan must still be used for purposes allowed. Right. So, so we've been getting that, that question a lot and you, you can apply for both the PPP and the EIDL loan. Now the, the regs that first came out for the PPP actually provided a way to figure out the PPP loan amount taking into consideration EIDL um, funds that might have been received up until April 3rd, I believe it was. So, you know, there, yes, you can um, pursue both of them. If you're pursuing a PPP loan, the timeline on, on that is going to be much quicker because you're going through an SBA lender, and that's why the program was was designed that way. And so, likely um, for Minnesota businesses, we we came online with EIDL later than a few other states. So probably the case is going to be you can pursue a PPP loan, and you and um, likely the EIDL loan won't be won't be a factor. Um, if if anyone has questions about that, that's something they can email our office about as well. Chris, we just have a few minutes left. I think it's important that uh, we assure those who have provided questions that we will make them available to our panelists so they will see what the business community still has questions regarding. Not that they will particularly get back to these individuals, but see the themes, see the concerns, and incorporate those into maybe future presentations or into conversations they have within their organizations. So the questions will certainly be valued and we will make the most of those going forward, even though we don't have the opportunity to respond to them today. Congressman, any concluding remarks? We're committed to being done by 415. It's 412. So uh, you were the one, really, to your credit and to your department or to your office that encouraged us to move forward with this. And so thank you for doing that. And uh, we will welcome your concluding remarks. Um, thank you very much, David. I, I appreciate the ha having this time. And I really want to thank you, David, for your leadership of the chamber, uh, for Bailey Olson, Chris Johnson as well and John Kirshner uh, from our U.S. Chamber and Brian McDonald from the Small Business Administration out of Minneapolis. Um, the, the whole goal is to make this uh, as easy as possible for you, the small business uh, man or woman. And I know it's not easy, but um, every time you give us uh, opportunities to do better, we're trying to reflect your suggestions or ideas in this legislation. And again, together we're gonna uh, do it um, and we're going to become up stronger, more resilient, and more self-reliant. I do want to give you a couple of numbers uh, because constituent services are the, pri are the uh, uh, um, number one priority for our office, and it always has been. So if anybody, and I know John and Brian are going to give their numbers too, but if anybody has any questions, please reach out to these two numbers. Uh, the Hermantown office is 218-481-6396. And our DC office is 202-225-6211. And, I say, and I've always said small businesses are the engine of our economy. Uh, we all on this phone, phone call know it. And I'm uh, just privileged to be able to serve in this capacity uh, and help us all out at this time. So David, I'll uh, throw this back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. John, any contact number or email address for our participants? 
Yeah, absolutely. The best way to reach me would be via email, uh, J Kirchner, K I R C H N E R at uschamber.com, or you can always reach me on my mobile phone, 612 619 2048, or always feel free to reach out to the team there at the Duluth Chamber and they will get your information questioned to me and I will we'll get you the answer you need. Thank you so much, John. And finally, Brian, any contact information you would like to share? Sure, I would recommend email as well right now at minneapolis.mn at sba.gov and follow us on sba.gov slash updates as well. So thank you. Thank you to the three of you. We greatly appreciate it. And you've encouraged us to do more of these in the future, which we will do. So thank you. And we will conclude our program wishing all of those in attendance the very best and uh, stay strong during this very difficult time. Appreciate it. Have a great day. This ends our program.